Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're in the world. Uh, this is Galen Growth uh, sitting in Basel in Switzerland, home to Galen Growth, of course, Roche Novartis and the Life Science Center of Europe. Uh, welcome today to the Galen Growth Core Summit 2021, which is Galen Growth annual social responsibility program dedicated to scaling digital health ventures. Through this program, startups engage in Galen Growth's unmatched network of corporate and investor decision makers to increase their visibility in the digital health community and build relationships to, e to reach our common goal of solving the pain points in the patient journey. We grow the ecosystem together effectively. It is a unique program with no fees, no equity taken as we collaborate together to push innovation further. Today, I'm joined by two very promising digital health ventures, uh, all members of our program. So on my panel from Kimbo Care, our Muriel Tiambo, who is the co-founder of Kimbo Care, I also have for Hanai, Shamala Hen Henriksen, sorry if I mispronounced it, who is founder and CEO of Hanai. My name is Julius Salaberry. I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Galen Growth. And Galen Growth is the global leading digital health, private market data and analytics and matchmaker to industry and to investors. And we are uh, very pleased to be able to host uh, these two panelists this evening as part of our cohort summit program uh, next week. Before I start, though, with any with questions to bring alive what uh, these two ladies are doing on a day to day basis with their ventures, let me just share a few stats with you to give you some context. Kimbo Care claims to be leveraging a blockchain and advanced analytics to allow immigrants around the world to remotely purchase medical care for their families back in their home country with the assurance of transparency and high quality care. Dying to know a bit more about this, but some key stats for you. It was founded in 2019 in Switzerland, Basel, I think, or was it further south? I think uh, Muriel will let us know where in Switzerland. It is a B2C model. Uh, we categorize them as in the medical payments category, uh, pre Series A venture, as are most of the uh, cohort members, with an alpha score of 40. Now, the alpha score is a calculation that Galen Growth conducts as to the maturity of the business, and 40 is a very, really good score for a pre Series A business. Hanai is empowering women in rural and marginalized communities to take charge of their health. Again, very much looking forward to seeing how that's uh, being achieved. Some key stats founded in 2018 in the US of A. It is again a B2C model. We categorize them as a health information platform. Um, it is a pre Series A business and an alpha score of 37. So, as you can see, roughly the same ballpark figure as Kimbo Care. And again, a good score for a pre Series A business. So, today we're going to focus on healthcare with impact. And for me, that's a particularly interesting topic, largely because I hear the word impact being banded everywhere. I'm dying to know what we're really doing in impact rather than what I hear in the newspapers. Our synopsis is that some regions in the world remain the least digitized with limited access to healthcare providers, quality care and information. These underserved countries, and I would say regions, are in great need of new technologies and enablers to build a positive impact on key issues. In this panel, we're going to explore what it takes for these ventures to scale their new digital health solutions in these regions that are in, in much need of disruption. So let me start with the first question. I'm going to start with you, Shimala, if I may. If I may. Um, it's not an easy world to be operating in uh, from a perspective of uh, income status, from a perspective of regulation, from a, a perspective of investors not really understanding the space, et cetera. So, Help me understand what the challenges are and the pain points you're aiming to solve within that environment. But what do you think are the, going to be, or have been, sorry, are going to be the biggest challenges uh, that face anyone trying to operate in the healthcare impact space? So it's a big question. So we'll start with what you're trying to solve, and then let's start, then look at uh, what you're having to overcome to solve. Sure. I think at the at the gist of it. Um, our ethos is very much equality. So if you look at the stats, and I won't ramble off into it, but you know, 80% um, of the rural population will never see a doctor in their lifetime. One in six children will actually die by the age of three. The stats are staggering. And a big thing that I see there is the equality component. Those of us who live in, you know, the economic global north in, in you know, very much so in the developed nations across the globe, we do not have these in our usual day-to-day -day urban settings. 
while I was pregnant, if I had a headache, um, swollen ankles, feeling nauseous, being dizzy, I just had to pick up the phone and call my doctor's office and he'd tell me, you're in trouble, you need to get in here immediately. But a similar situation, a woman sitting somewhere else, let's just say in rural Kenya or in a refugee camp in Mauritania, she'll have those same symptoms while pregnant and she won't know until it's way too late. And the big Dividing the gap there is just the whole equality thing. I have equality. Fine, we are looking at the larger inequality of economic status and just uh, industrialization and urbanization around us, but it's also inequality to access to information, um, inequality to just education, inequality just knowing what's happening to yourself. So that's probably where that, that's the point that we've chosen to go into. Let's just try and bridge that inequality in access to that healthcare education. Let's just give this to people. And we do it with people who have um, mobile phones so that we also had to have a, make a very hard decision and say like, we have to stop at where, as long as someone has access to a mobile phone, then we are able to help them. And if not, unfortunately not this time around. So that's the pain point we solve. We wanna make sure everyone has equal access to healthcare. They may not see a doctor, so to speak, but they may be at least, at the very least, be able to access information about healthcare and when it is an emergency, when they're closest doctors. That's the problem we're trying to solve. And we're mm -hmm. doing this within the constraints of, as you mentioned when you introduced the question earlier, regulations, country by country, it differs. People, some people, some countries, some politicians are threatened uh, by efforts when. Um, an organization like Hanai comes in and says, I'm gonna run a, an empowerment program now to make sure your women are all uh, you know, up to date on their own bodies and what it entails. Like Hanai as a company has been threatened uh, by state politicians and told never to show up and had our flights canceled and our hotels block booked. And you know we haven't stepped foot there again in a bit, but then again, that's what happened with the pandemic. So we are saying it's the pandemic that caused us not to go back, not the threat. Um, but I think I'm, I'm, I'm stating an extreme of a situation where it comes to what you deal with. So you have entire healthcare ecosystems of nations, and then you have individuals who are on the ground who control the people that, um, that we work with. Um, you know, we are about to we are about to start work in Mauritania with Mali refugees in camps, and we have to then deal with the whole um, various other networks who are on the ground who are all scrambling to. You know, we all I suppose everyone's scrambling to do a good job, but those are all the regulatory. And I think Muriel will probably speak more to it in a bit. Um, it, it's it's a common pain point for all of us. We try to do all this. We also set ourselves up as, as businesses, as social, as social enterprises, because we are not interested in getting the one-time wham of you know a million dollars and told to run the project. And then when that million dollars runs out, these organizations step back and leave people worse off um, than they originally were. And that's just awful. We see that a lot in the field. You see all rotting posters on the walls. Or, uh, and things like that. So we didn't want to be that. We said, no, we're going to run sustainable businesses that this is just going to keep going regardless of whether we are on the ground. When we walk away 20 years down the road, people on the ground are going to be able to run this on their own. So we decided, uh, Hanai made it a point saying we're going to go for that niche. And when you go into that niche, you then fight for money together with the next Shmojo is also fighting money for the next electric car and a car that drives itself and a drone. And you are now in that market and you're not going to give everybody their 3X returns tomorrow. You, we will along the way, but not now. And then investors look at us with, oh, yeah, it's really nice. But are you sure you're not a net for profit? I'm like, you know, why don't you talk with the UN? Why don't you talk to Miller Melinda Gates? I'm like, oh my God, no. Um, so yeah, that's, these are the day-to-day -day constraints for the next person who asks me why you're not a non-for-profit. <sighs> Better be a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop there. I hope that person would not be Julia. <laughs> so why are you not a non-for-profit business then, uh, Trimala? 
<laughs> You've got distance to your advantage. advantage you're far away. I'm, feeling, I'm feeling very safe inside of Zoom, you're right. Muriel, uh, over to you. Uh, over to me, uh, mm. Shamala, you did a great job and there, there is so much connection between what you say and what I'm about to say as well. Uh, so probably I'm just going to rebound on some of the things that you said. Number one, as you guys know, Kimbo Care um, is a tech solution that enables, I would say, anyone to purchase medical care for people who cannot afford it. So we're also playing in that field of equity, uh, equity in health access. Um, I want to say, if I'm going to rebound a little bit on Shamara's comment, is that in this process of enabling more people to have access to healthcare, the very interesting, I mean, there are a lot of very interesting challenges that we kind of like have to deal with uh, as we bring the solution into the market. So here we're dealing with people in, in underdeveloped regions. Those are people uh, who are, who still have to fight <laughs> every day, right? To, to choose between do we eat or do we need to see a doctor? Right, um, so there are still a lot of basic needs that are hard to address uh, by those people. And then so we, we have to deal with this urgency around health education as well, uh, even in the way that we're bringing the solution um, uh, to the market, to those patients and to those givers. The givers are, the givers are typically uh, the, 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 the people living in the North, uh, who have families back home in Africa and are helping their families. Typically, uh, traditionally, they have been called out when the, the case is so grave, that is so expensive, and usually, and, and a lot of time, it actually results in deaths because number one, it's too I mean, it's expensive, but also it's too late. It's just too grave. And, and the quality is not always there. Uh, the transparency is not always there. So there is a lot of frustration where people have even given the money, but no one really knows what actually happened. <laughs> and then so for what we're really trying to do is, yes, faci facilitate that sort of like transfer of help because on one end in the world, we have people who can afford it. And, the, and on the other end, we have people who cannot even afford the basic, basic, basic health needs. So let's connect those people. Number two, which is the, another great, another big challenge that we're dealing with is uh, going back to this health education piece is that people, yes, may not necessarily be educated, but sometimes again, as I was saying, it's also because they just like, okay, I'm just having this headache. It's okay, I'm used to having headache, right? Uh, my, 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 my leg is hurting very much, uh, it's okay, it's gonna pass, right? Maybe I just need to go and sleep and it's gonna pass, it's gonna be better. And maybe it's right, maybe tomorrow they'll be better, but they still don't know if there is something bigger behind it. And they will not have that doctor that Shamala has access to, uh, to just like call and then just be reassured about that. And then, so that's how we see people wait too long, too long and uh, to get care. And this is something we want success for us in the longer term is to change that cultural mindset that people be more proactive when it gets to health. And, and, and that will come with a lot of education um, around, around why, why it is important, why preventive care is important. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so we'll come back to to how you are respectively achieving this. Um, any specific challenges, uh, Muriel, that um, you and your brother are facing um, that uh, Shamala hasn't mentioned that you think are worth the focus? Uh, I think for us, it's really a, a lot of it is really on that cultural side. Um, mm -hmm. I think for Shamala, it sounded that uh, your solution really brings that sort of like um, it. Um, uh, education part to it. Um, for us, we want even to make sure that people understand the importance of that education, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then so I feel like is and, and, and that is just because uh, it, they have to choose between things that are also very important. 
And that's why we're making the help to be very dedicated to health. It, from that point, there is no other choice. The only way you can use the help that is being given to you is just to access care. And therefore, hopefully then uh, you have to use it and start to see the benefits. Um, outside of that, uh, so I, I, I talked about the givers a little bit. I talked about the patients a little bit. We have similar issues when it comes to investors uh, as well, but maybe we can talk more about that later, but very similar issues. Okay, well, we'll come back to it, definitely. Um, but both of you are located in the US, so, um, and you could be, I mean, the US has its very large share of underserved and, you know, underprivileged population um, that are struggling to get to healthcare. So, you know, how would you respond to anyone saying to you, listen, you're both in the US, why are you worrying about countries that are a long, long, long way away when, you know, there are populations that are going without healthcare or uh, well, proper healthcare is certainly much nearer to you. <laughs> I can I can start. I think the US mm -hmm. is such a great question because uh, I think before we started Kimbo Care, um, no, I, I don't know. L let me take a step back. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, the US is actually a very developed country, and it's been amazing, especially with the pandemic, to see how how the stats are actually playing out when you start to look at them when it mm -hmm. comes to pregnancies or when it comes to covid or when it comes to some old other sort of like you know um medical issues it's impressive to see how much of certain communities are actually impacted by things that uh many of us don't get to see day to day Right, and we are in a developed country, and 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 to see the relation with everything that we're doing uh, for the developing regions, that's very interesting. So, can Kimbuke help uh, a place like the U.S. potentially? It will have to be con contextualized. But one thing that I've noted, and Shamal, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts on that: uh, mm -hmm. the medical or the health system in the U.S. Uh, is, I don't. I don't think there is anything more complex than that <laughs> around in the world. Um, and, and I knew it before Kimbo Care, and I know it even more now. And it is extremely complex. And one thing that we're really going after with Kimbo Care is value-based care, which has been discussed in the States for over 10 years, almost 20 years now. And every decade, it makes like, oh, this is a something, something big new that we need to do. Uh, but it's the struggle because we are dealing with strongly implanted systems that needs to actually connect from a data perspective to get that value-based uh, care really effective, but it's not happening. So they, everyone kind of shared the vision, but everyone has his own way of thinking about it. And not enough people are willing to put the right investment to, to, get to, 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 to get where we need to be. A lot of systems have been designed a certain way. Do we leverage the system to get there? Or do we decide together to build new systems? So because there is something already existing and already strong and already so complex, in my opinion, it makes healthcare, uh, it makes, sometimes it actually makes in my opinion, it makes um, a disruption, like what we're trying to do in those developing regions, actually harder to implement. And we've seen that they've been trying for years and decades now. So we'll see when we land. Okay, thanks, Nuru. Uh, Shala, what's, uh, what's your think, response? The US is both the best and the worst place to fall ill. So, and, it, and that is completely uh, divided by your economic status. So it's either when you have the, if you work, I live in California, I live in San Francisco. So I'm surrounded by the techies. So mm -hmm. here it's the best place to fall ill. We have all everything that you could possibly need that will save your life. It's within your reach if you have access to that insurance. And mm -hmm. I've never, I don't know, at least in my experience, just like Muriel, sort of looking across the world, um, to give you context, I am Southeast Asia. I'm born in Malaysia. And it's a country that gives you, you need a ringgit, which is something like 20 cents um, to access healthcare. So anybody with 20 cents can access healthcare. 
So you can go walk into any one of the public institution hospitals and get healthcare. It, and and for you know within its means and reasons, I I am a, an advocate for it to say that a country that is a developing country can get it right sometimes to that extent. What happened here? And there are many reasons, I'm sure, and I'm not the expert on it. I find it painful in the US that preventative care is just absent. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's great in dealing with you once you've got stage four cancer, but it doesn't, and, that, and a, 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 there are a lot of things to it, with things which I'm learning from that how grand their lobbying efforts are, how grand the sugar lobby can be, how grand, uh, you know, the cigarette lobby can be still and things like that. So it's, it's a way to learn. Hanai can address some of the, the health uh, education disparities and we can work in that. I keep meeting others who are doing it, whether it's for the Latina communities, for the black communities, for the displaced communities, there are people going in working at that level. And it's also a country that, it's, it's a large country between where Muriel is in New York and where I am, the, the states in the middle between us handle their healthcare and education completely differently. So uh, it's also not a uni, unified system as you would see in the UK, which then just rolls it out across the board. We all have the same thing. We're all going to do the same thing. So I have a long-winded answer, something that puzzles me on a day-to-day -day basis as to how I can live in both, like, you know, the best and the worst of things in situations like this. And it's not just healthcare, it's also education, safety, security across the board. Um, mm -hmm. And we operate, then we had to make points as to we, we want to operate where people are vulnerable where a quick we, we we need because of the fact that we also need to show data and how we are the traction is going we needed to operate in a place where we could get in and see very quickly fixing things and beginning to monitor that across the board having smaller cohorts of people but then being able to track that through and not needing to jump through american bureaucracy hoops as of yet so one of the biggest challenges that I think, and I will come back to investors in a minute, Muriel, I know you were alluding to that, but it's linked to that because, of course, one of the biggest challenges investors will accuse um, impact-focused uh, digital health ventures is the business model and how to make sure it's sustainable. Uh, and I think uh, it was either you, Shimano, or you, Muriel, someone mentioned around the fact that, you know, sometimes large grants arrive, something gets set up, everyone has a whizzy time and then the grant runs out and the whole thing falls apart, leaving a lot of people um, hanging with, uh, with no health care. So how, do you, how are you going to avoid that? How are you building your business model so that it actually stays sustainable, which means that you, know, you won't end up suddenly falling off a cliff? Start with, uh, with you, Muriel, sorry. Yeah, I can start. Uh, uh, so yeah, we want, um, and, and we have had, <laughs> so much, uh, we, people don't ask us why not why are you not uh I, uh, not for profit they're like you should be a not for profit and we're like no <laughs> um but it's really we could we could run a slightly different model and or a slightly different business and it would run maybe even better i don't know but <laughs> it would run just fine as a not for profit but that's not that's not the vision that we had. We the vision for us was in the same way that we really want to empower those patients in the long term to take care of their own health, right? We wanted to build a business that addresses a need, an existing need enough that naturally, right, there is the consumption of the solution versus waiting for that grant, grant and then help people. Like for us really is that if we can really help the people who are here uh, as they want to help their family uh, adopt more preventive care, then eventually it's less money for them to spend. And it's just a better life for their patients to, to live because then they can go to school or they will not stop going to school because they're sick. They will not stop going to work because they're sick. Because a lot of time that is what is happening right now. They will call you and they're not doing anything because they're sick. 
and they've been waiting for a long time. So now you have to pay for the hospital stay and so on and so forth. And it's very expensive. A lot of us here, African immigrants, we don't earn a lot of money, right? So, so that's, that's kind of like, we want to give through our business model. We want the business model that is basically, that is building a self momentum, right? It's fueling itself versus waiting for the grant or depending on a grant that's happening once in a year or once every five years. I don't know, but really that's, that was the idea. So for us, it's really let's have a giver purchasing a transaction on our platform. That transaction is nothing else than basically a gift card for healthcare for their family mm -hmm. members. And, and then they can use that at one of our medical partners. And then the idea is to sort of like use our platform as they need it over time. And then, and then the goal, if you succeed, is that they would need it less, but not necessarily less often, but less often for expensive treatment. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, yourself, Shamala, with Hanai? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, this, this, I'm going to be the one who's going to always start with a fact and figure and bore Please. people. But I think it's a McKinsey um, stat. It costs $8 per person to access healthcare in general, just across the board in a rural setting. If you mm -hmm. use a mobile phone intervention first, you bring that cost down to 2 to $3. So that's a massive okay. for individual. Now, you, this, the, all of us on this panel and people listening go like, oh my God, that's just like a light bulb, right? But, and then can you imagine just trying to drive that down into entire, um, you know, healthy, healthcare ecosystems or investors and things. And, and people are still looking at me going, no, but it's so complicated. When are you going to see this happening? So, yeah, it is, it is a process. It is a process of um, also not being pegged with the non-for-profit thing is one thing, but the other thing is very often being told, uh, look at the companies that are, you know, the CSR profiles of those companies, and then just try and peg yourself in there into their CSR money, which is usually, you know, at the end of the day within the profits of a company, they say, oh, we'll give you this little pocket money to play with and then hand it out. So it's so hard to be taken um, seriously that we are actually a serious business and not just uh, running around for handouts and being in a position to just say no. So we've had a bit of luck or, or you know, we've worked towards being able to actually charge an organization and say, this is the cost, this is what's going to happen. If you want to get your uh, healthcare access education out to the community, you know, this is the X amount, this is the margin, and that's what's happening. So it's, it's a process. Sometimes people, I've had people want to use our services so turn around and say uh, you need to pay $200 a month uh, to have an intern help out on this project I'm like okay there's some weird communication has gone on here like I don't know whether you think I've got deep pockets that I'm going to offer you the service and the money and everything else and hold your hand along the way so like Muriel it's it's uh, it's the long game you have to get yourself every day you wake up and you say okay today I'm going to get like you know a couple of challenges thrown my way I'm going to repeat this story for the nth time but there's also those days where it just goes you you see that email and say you got the contract like you know we're going to do this we're starting in October so well done and then you say thank you very much and and um or there are days like um I was up, up very very early this morning because it's send us through what it's going to cost to get this done in Afghanistan now. And I'm like trying to find numbers and putting it together and hoping that it'll work out. So there are those extremes of it. And it could happen by the end of the day, I'll get a note saying, yes, it is happening in Afghanistan. So. Mm -hmm. True. We're up against the clock here. So we, uh, we need to probably have just one last question before we wrap up. Um, and, and it's connected to really what both of you just been saying in relation to business model and and funding. Um, I'm intrigued. You know, do investors that you speak to really understand uh, impact startups? Um, and and what? How, how do you you know how do you find investors that actually understand it? And what, what does impact investment really mean? Is I guess the main question here. I let Shamala start. Sure, I, I can. <laughs> because I've also sort of like been in a network, like you see a lot of, 
a lot is an exaggeration. You see a number of like, you know, gender equity investment, uh, impact investment boards for everybody. They've come up, like a lot of people, clever people have sat together and said, um, you need to look for these factors. You need to have all of these. So on, on paper and on the theoretical level, they have all these numbers and all these fabulous things that they've come up with and what they're going to look for when they're looking to invest with mm -hmm. impact. And I've actually been, I won a scholarship to sit as an entrepreneur in a couple of the meetings. And I questioned them. I said, you have these odd numbers where you say that you need to have uh, 50,000 people um, having signed up for the service, being impacted, their healthcare. I'm like, 50,000 people do not live on that island. So how did you come up with this figure? Like, it's very arbitrary numbers. So I question that. I question these numbers that have been given to people who are in the decision-making process and what they're looking for in terms of impact. A lot of clever people have sat down and written this down, great for them, but on the ground, things do not actually operate that way. So yeah, there are these, this, it, there is a bucket of, in, there, there's a bucket full of investors or investment bodies who specifically look at projects that have got women of color, it's, or you know, there's a, a, a gender and diversity component to it, or looking at on the ground that you know it must involve women or it must involve X, Y, Z. So there's there is a large, large um, you know a, a myriad of, of factors that go in there. So there are those organizations, and then very often, um, yeah, it's hard for me at least. I've, I've gone through the process to hit those numbers. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, you know, we don't have. 50 million people in that entire country. So we will not achieve your targets. So there's that. And very often when um, speaking, I think it's it's a ca categorically investors that we have spoken to, we fall very low on the rungs because they want to see if they, the ones that we speak to, especially if they're junior level in their companies or just bringing in the first few portfolio companies. So we are like, no, they're not going to give us returns quickly. We need to you know build up. So we'll keep them lower for later, talk to us again in two or three years. So I think in a panel like this in two to three years, I'll be speaking differently, I really hope. So do I. <laughs> so the story will be different, but at this level, it can be very tiring and it can be very lonely. And um, having to repeat um, the story, having to sound that I'm a valid businesswoman is sometimes tiring. And I'm not sure whether it's a gender thing or it's a racial thing or where those components are. So I just take it all in and I open that box every single time I'm speaking to them and say like, no, here are my numbers. This is what we offer. This is what's going to happen. This is the timeline that this is going to happen at, um, you know, we've been funded by Founders Capital. Like we'd, we've done so much through just this box of money. We did not need to have and we are running on the ground already so you know we're not right. an idea so I, I i know i seem extremely proud as i see this but hana as a company has been very humble but it's 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 a it's such a struggle and then you stand there and you go you'd rather give 1.5 million to this guy beside me who's got an idea who hasn't put it together yet as opposed to the women who's you know, the, the woman who's no longer prostituting herself every Sunday because she now knows the impact that it has on her body and has gone to look for another employment. I know it's an anecdotal story and it doesn't translate to your $500,000, but it's very real. So I, my, my frustrations are very real and you probably can see the passion as I talk about it. <laughs> um, sure. But it's on, on that so on that same note, on the very same day, it's also a case of Shama, you know, tell me, will 650,000 solve your problem today over a period of 18 months? And I go on, we go on, just that Kimbo Care, I'm a big fan of Kimbo Care and what it's doing. And, you know, it needs to spread to very many parts of the world. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Muriel, what's, what's your point of view then to, to wrap us up tonight? Yes, my point of view is uh, a part of it aligns a lot with what you just said, Shamala, and another part is about, I think, some of the learning that I think we have had to learn the harder way. Um, 
I think when it comes to, and to be honest, I, I am certain that in three years or five years, I don't know exactly when that happens, but it's going to happen. You certainly will be sitting here and having another discussion because I feel the, 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 the startups that are suffering the most about that sort of like investor judgment thing are really the early stage startups. Once you are past that stage, your life is a much, I think, enjoyable life. And, and I, one thing that I've, I've been wondering, and I don't know, maybe Julian even has also a point of view on that, is that the, the startups, when we talk to people, I think there are two perceptions. Either people are very surprised that we're still alive and doing business, mm -hmm. because 90% of them at least die anyway, or people are expecting to see the startup that is making all the news, that is raising $2 million by just doing that. They literally just created the ideas three, four months ago. We are seeing that all over. Six months ago, and they're raising a $1 million, right? And it's like, oh, if you're not there, then you probably must be dying soon. Oh, you're still alive. Oh, and then so <laughs> we... I have kind of like been thinking that, okay, that's common. I would say up until recently, that's probably common knowledge, right? Like common thinking, but investor would be a little smarter about that. Like, and I'm starting to think generally, of course, I'm sure there are exceptions, but I'm starting to think that maybe not, maybe the investors too are kind of like looking very seriously at those things because they all say we're looking for early stage startups, but they're asking us for things that we are being asked to series A startups, right? It's like, at which point do you really consider an early stage startup as an early stage startup, right? All you need to look at is the team, right? Is the vision, is this something you want to invest in? That is also written, it's, it's everywhere. But I'm struggling to see, to find, not only I wonder if they do understand startups in general, but I mean, many of them. And then the second thing is that, do they differentiate? Because I've also been attending a lot of conversations. They come to the meeting, to the panel as two different or three different investor company, investment companies, but they all have the same theory, investment theory. They're all looking at the exact same thing. And I'm like, again, who is going to invest in those early stage startups that are not necessarily, that need the money, especially when it comes to the B2C, that need the money to actually run marketing, to run the sales, so they can really have that, achieve that product market fit, right? And then the learning part of all this. <laughs> uh, if I could that, add, sorry, sorry, go on, yeah. I didn't realize you were yeah. something more. I'll let you finish and yeah, then that, add something. Ah, okay, so uh, um, I'm almost done. So the learning part of this mm -hmm. is that this is just the reality. And maybe I get to change the word. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, and maybe I don't. But this is the reality Kimboke is in today. And what we have learned really is that it is critical to be in the right ecosystem to be connected to the right people. Those people who are raising a million after they have just launched an idea four months before, a lot of people are raising a million without even being on the market. Like you said earlier, Shamala, they are just like, this is the idea we're raising. The, the reason they're doing that, it's not because they have a much better idea than you. It's because they have the right connection. And this is something that we didn't, we didn't understand when we started. Frank and I thought we are well-educated. We know what we do. We have the vision. We have the mission. It's going to be enough. People are going to open the door, the doors. No, it doesn't work that way. I think if I could add to your point, Muriel, it's the other thing that Hanai had to reconcile with or make one of the things that we decided was raising the million is not the indication of our success. I think uh, every time I see news bit about a company X or Y has raised a million or two million or three million, that will not be the driving, um, that, that, that does not mean we've been successful. That's not it. We have different indicators of success, which are reflect upon whatever, what Muriel has said earlier as well. We are more about 
the impact in the lives that we're changing on the ground while creating a sustainable future for all of us at large. No, no, I would echo that. And it's certainly half the battle we have at Galen Growth talking to you know, large farmer or even investors around the fact, well, funding data is lovely, but it really isn't an indicator whether that particular venture is solving a problem and what its future potential is. And so let's get beyond funding data and financials, really look at what's been achieved clinically, what's been achieved regulatory level, what's been achieved, you know, at a product market fit level. So no, I echo that. This is Muriel and um, Shamala, thank you very much for your time this evening. Uh, I really admire the passion that comes through in this conversation and the fact that you are trying to solve a, a pain point in a, in a market or in a set of markets that are often forgotten or, or disregarded largely because there isn't that 10x, that obvious 10x um, upside at the end of the rainbow. So, you know, long may you continue pushing and driving and growing and scaling your businesses. Um, you know, Galen Growth will continue keeping a very close, watchful eye on, on how, you're, how you're growing. And uh, we wish you the very best of luck. And again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shamela. Bye, guys.